Dustin, did you get an email from Aaron Barfield? No, I did not. Yeah, he said he sent it. I'm going to send him my link forward to him or if you can be sent to him because he really is, his voice is important. Good morning, Chair Postman, members Gar Garrett and Volandroff, staff and guests. The lobbies are open. The recording has begun. Great. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, good morning, everybody. We're going to convene the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board meeting for Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. Um, first, if everyone can silence their phones, that would be great. Um, uh, as Gretchen mentioned, all the meetings are recorded. recorded. This meeting is being recorded now. Uh, for those that are in the room here, as we say every week, just Please uh, remember the microphones in this room are really sensitive. They can pick up side conversations, rustling a paper or anything else. If you have a sidebar conversation, step out into the lobby and come back in when you're done, if you could. It really helps the people who are watching online. Um, we got a, a fairly full agenda, so we're going to uh, uh, try to move through it all with everyone's cooperation. Uh, our first item um, is... Uh, uh, a uh, year of uh, service recognition. Um, and I'm, oh, there's our CFO, Jim Morgan, there now. Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you for this. Thank you, Chair Postman. It's my pleasure to be here today to recognize Rick Tedrow. Rick is one of our uh, stalwart audit uh, team members, and we are honoring Rick for 25 years of state service. Rick served time with the Department of Revenue and as an auditor with the State Auditor's Office and is now in his 10th year at, at LCB. He lives in this... I'm sorry. He lives in the Seattle area and covers a, a wide variety of licensees in that region. And he's particularly noted for his calming presence with licensees who have uh, have to have difficult tax discussions with in the in the audit line of work. Uh, the discussions are not always happy news, uh, but Rick handles those with with the plum. So it is my pleasure to recognize Rick and I hope you will join me in uh, celebrating his 25 years of state service. Absolutely. Rick, are you with us? I uh, yes, I am. Oh, there you are. Hello. There we go. Uh, uh, congratulations. This is this is great. And uh, um, tell us all how you stay calm when uh, <laughs> taxpayers <laughs> may not be. What can we learn from you? Uh, I take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, th that usually helps. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good advice. Thank you. Um, it's it's the, the years have flown by and. Um, um, I, when I started here, I think, well, through the time I've been here, um, it, I, it's been gone through privatization and more recently legalization. And uh, it's really cool to be part of this agency and, and um, uh, go through a lot of, and frankly, it's been just a lot of growth. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't have anything else to compare it with because I wasn't here in the earlier times, so uh, but uh, um, it's it's cool to be part of it now. That's great. Yeah, I don't know that there's an agency uh, in state government that's gone through what uh, this agency has in terms of uh, contraction and growth and back again uh, in the 25 years you've been here. So that's got to have been something. Yeah, yeah, it is, and uh, uh, and, uh, and it's great people. Everybody that I've worked with is very collaborative, and uh, um, you know, uh, it's 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 awesome. It's a it's a great audit staff, and um, Jim's been great to work with, and uh, um, I have nothing bad to say about anybody here because it's all been good. That's great. Good, because we might not have invited you if you had your going to say. <laughs> it's all, it's all, it's five star reviews. We, we might not have invited you back for your 50th, I guess. Is oh, what I have to say. So, yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations, Rick. I think it's great. Thanks for all you do for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Rick. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for uh, joining us and, and setting that up. And uh, we will find a time uh, sometime in the near future to talk about your service because uh, Jim uh, Morgan has announced he'll be retiring soon. And uh, we will have to find a way to uh, uh, 
uh, honor him uh, as as is his due soon. So, to come. Um, moving along, uh, we're going to get an update on rulemaking timelines from uh, Dr. Hoffman. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Postman, Board Member uh, Vollinger and Garrett. Nice to see everyone this morning. Um, I'm going to be real brief about our rules in progress because I, I gave a pretty comprehensive report yesterday, I think. And there's really not a lot to report because oh, we're still we're going to bring new staff on next week. I'm happy to report. I'll get a little more on that next week during caucus. But um, so rules are kind of holding right now. We do have some um, opportunities for interaction coming up with the um, work group that Jeff's putting together for quality control rule review and evaluation and then the cannabinoid science work group that I'll be chairing starting December 1st. So more information on that. So um, I'll just stop right there with the update for now. And then if people want a more comprehensive review, they can look at the TVW recording from yesterday. Yeah, that's okay. Good. All right. So is it okay to move on to the next Please. agenda item? Yeah. All right. So uh, moving on to agenda item um, for concerning updating obsolete addresses in our current rules, I'd like to ask for approval to file these rules today, assuming you adopt them. So for a brief background, the board approved filing a CR 105 for expedited rulemaking on August 17th for this project. And as you know, expedited rulemaking allows an agency to make limited technical changes for things like addresses, as we have here in this project, without a public hearing. And it provides interested parties with 45 days after the 105 is filed to comment. Um, we provided notice to our stakeholders in the usual fashion that we do, and no comments were received. Um, so the package before you today for adoption is the same as was presented on August 17th in the 105. So if adopted today, these rules would be filed with the code revisor and become effective 31 days after filing or on December uh, 11th. So I'd ask for your approval to uh, adopt these rules. Well, ask for you to adopt these rules today and then I'll file them with the code revisor. Okay. Um, any questions about change of address? No? Uh, then... Uh, uh, would entertain a, a motion to adopt a CR 103 for updating obsolete addresses in Title 314 of the WAC. I move we adopt the CR 103 for updating obsolete addresses in the Title 314 of WAC. And a second. I second that motion. Great, then that is approved. Thank you. Check that off and all right. Alcohol. Yes, thank you. So moving on to agenda item number five, and this concerns rescission of board interim policy 01-2020 concerning uh, frozen alcohol popsicles. So in the past, um, our agency denied all packaging and labeling requests for alcohol-infused products resembling or having the same packaging characteristics of fro frozen products that are generally marketed to persons under 21 like Otter Pops uh, and Push Pops and that kind of thing. And this product has gained popularity and packaging and labeling submissions that we received increased. Uh, and we learned that multiple other states were allowing these products in various shapes or forms. So in August of 2020, agency staff brought discussion points to the board to decide whether our approach aligned with that of other states. And the board agreed that reevaluation of our current approach was necessary. And so the licensing division was tasked to prepare a board and own policy. Um, and under direction and further review, several of our previous denials were withdrawn for those infused products, excuse me, because they were found not to be especially appealing to persons under 21 and were designed in a manner to appeal to the adult consumer. Um, so the policy was adopted in December the board and our policy was adopted in December of 2020 and revised again in August of 2021. So we added some additional guidelines in 2021. And although it was designed to end on the date rules became effective to implement the interim policy, we haven't entered into a rulemaking yet, but we still need to have this policy in place. So we have those guardrails in place for um, packaging uh, review. So we'd like to convert this board interim policy to a policy statement as we have in the last 
you know, year or so. Um, and so if you approve rescission of this BIP today, we'll, we will immediately file policy statement 2202. That's the same as this board interim policy, but just moving it into that policy statement format um, consistent with the Administrative Procedures Act. So I'd ask for your approval to rescind this policy today. Before we uh, take what I just want, we talked about this briefly yesterday, but I want again, sure. uh, you know, the, for, for everyone, the board interim policy was put in place out of a, a desire by the board to put some uh, uh, guide posts around what is allowed to try to control, as you said, what's particularly appealing to children. I think licensing has done a, a really good job at, at filtering that out and figuring out what that is. It's not an easy job. Um, but, you know, if and, I've, and the reason we delayed this is I wanted to find out more about it. And I've looked at some of the things that have been um, applied for, some of the names and lately applied for that we've rejected, which at the very least, come right up to appealing to children. And it, it, I just, I got to tell you, I just don't understand why the industry feels the need to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that was rejected was one of a, sort of a, a cartoonish uh, flamingo that was called Boozy, Freezy, Brisky, Frisky, Really Rumberry. I don't think adults need that to decide to, to partake in these things. Um, and even what's been approved, you know, sometimes it's still boozy freezy. Um, so as I said yesterday, I'm skeptical of this. I, 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 I don't have a problem with the product. I don't know why you can't market it just a little more adultly, but keeping the, this, this, uh, uh, set of rules in place, not rules, big R, but smaller the guidelines in place allows licensing to keep doing the job they're doing. And, and, um, I would be open to learning more about this as we go along and considering other things too. And, and if I may, certainly um, having the policy statement in place is going to, you know, it, it's a clear signal that we will engage in rulemaking in the not so distant mm -hmm. future. Um, and then it also gives um, constituents an opportunity to um, ask us to review the policy statement or compel us to move to rulemaking more quickly. So that's one of the advantages of moving it from a board interim policy to a policy. Statement. Which is why we've been doing it with all of these interim policies. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. How many have we done? About. Oh my gosh, we say eighteen or eight, nineteen. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments about frozen goosicles? Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve um, the rescission of board interim policy zero one dash twenty twenty regarding frozen alcohol popsicles? I make a motion that we uh, rescind board uh, interim policy 01-2020 regarding frozen alcohol policy. You second? This is Ali. I second. Great. And that is approved. Um, thank you. And then uh, move and right along back to uh, cannabis. Yes. And another uh, board interim policy rescission request. Um, so... Current statute provides that um, licensed cannabis producers and processors um, can purchase or use a CBD product obtained from a source outside of our regulated system only for the purposes of enhancing CBD concentration in the products that exist within our systems and are manufactured within our system. And we reflected that particular statute, and just for the record, it's 6953-26-1 in WAC 314-55-109. Um, challenge here is that when that rule was put into place, our leaf system didn't have the ability to track products that were manufactured outside of our system, CBD or otherwise. And so this board interim policy was put in place in, uh, on January 12th of 2019, or I'm sorry, June 12th of 2019, to um, allow people to still be able to bring that outsourced CBD into the I-502 system, but not report it into our leaf traceability system because the system wasn't set up for any outsourced products. So there wasn't any way for anyone to report that CBD had been outsourced and then brought into the system. It had to be 
memorialized within the system. So in December of 2021, um, we discontinued the LEAF data system and replaced it with our new reporting solution. And that's the Cannabis um, Central Reporting System. Um, and as a result, um, the, the Sport and policy is no longer needed because that outsourced CBD can be reported um, in the CCRS system. And un unlike the one we were just talking about, um, Bob's goes, we're just rescinding this one. It's not, we don't need it to live anywhere at this point. So this That's one right. is just, we've moved beyond it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, the, the leaf system has been retired and moved on to right. something different. Okay. So. And have other ways no to handle needed. that issue. Right. That's yeah. right. Okay. Great. Then is there a, a motion to approve the recommendation to rescind board interim policy 12 2019 regarding cannabinoid additives? I move that we uh, accept their motion to rescind the board interim policy 12209 regarding Caminar ad ad additives. Second. I second. And it's rescinded. Thank you. Great. Thanks Dr. very Hoffman. much. Appreciate that. Um, our next item uh, is rules petition review and consideration and uh, uh, Jeff Kildall, our policy and rules coordinator on the cannabis side will present that to us. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Postman and board members Garrett and Baldroff. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this rulemaking petition response today. Uh, <clears throat> on September 29th, 2022, the agency received a rulemaking petition from John Kingsbury. In his petition, Mr. Kingsbury requests the creation of a new administrative rule that would require cannabis retailers to display privacy policy information and policy signage in uh, retail stores and would restrict, restrict retailers or their vendors from storing a customer's information without prior consent. Mr. Kingsbury asserts that stores are scanning customer IDs upon entry in order to verify identification and age, but then also retaining that information for marketing purposes without informing customers that is what they are doing and without receiving customer consent. Mr. Kingsbury does not provide supporting documentation that personal information is retained for marketing purposes. Mr. Kingsbury states that private information related to cannabis purchases could restrict an individual's privileges related to firearm ownership. He also states that rules are needed because door monitors who check the identification of customers at cannabis retail stores never know what the retailer's privacy policies are concerning the retention of customer information. In a follow-up, Follow-up email received by LCB on October 13th, 2022, Mr. Kingsbury clarified his petition request with the following. My intent was not to require prior affirmative consent for scanning IDs for the purpose of verification of age or for purposes related to DOR or DOH requirements, but rather to require prior affirmative consent for storage of that information for marketing purposes. Point of sale data systems that can scan a customer's identification are used widely and legally in retail stores to establish the age of customers for age restricted products. Government issued ID cards are used widely and legally in retail stores to establish a customer's identity in situations such as when customers apply for credit, write a check, or use credit cards. In the event of a data breach involving personal information, RCW 19255010 explains what businesses must do to notify the customer. In practical terms, the requested rule would prevent licensed cannabis retail stores from retaining customer information without the agreement of the customer. If a customer objected to the privacy policy, the customer's information could not be retained. In order to monitor compliance with the requested rule, enforcement and education officers would have the investigative challenge of confirming that any customer whose information is included in a retail licensee's electronic records had consented to the privacy policy of the retailer. 
In addition to concerns surrounding storage of customer information, Mr. Kingsbury also asks for confidentiality of medical, rec medical recognition card information. The petition states that, quote, patient DOH regis registry identification cards should never, ever, ever, ever be used to retain personal information for marketing purposes or for any purposes other than to verify the patient status and for purposes dictated by DOH and DOR. It should be noted that the storage and use of medical recognition card information is currently regulated by the Washington State Department of Health and is restricted under RCW 6951A230 and the Department of Health's WAC 246-71-100, subsections 3 and 4. Any of the retail cannabis licensees holding a medical cannabis endorsement must, under LCB rules in WAC 314-55-010, subsection 3A, quote, follow all rules adopted by the Department of Health regarding retail sale of medical cannabis. While it is important to protect the personal information of customers, many types of businesses, including cannabis stores, must be able to confirm the age of customers by checking government-issued identification cards. In order to monitor compliance with the requested rule, the agency would have the additional duty of examining electronic business records of cannabis retailers and reviewing any private customer information found in those records. The requested rule and the additional compliance activity that would be required to enforce the rule are outside of the LCB's scope of authority and expertise. Additionally, the confidentiality of customer medical recognition card information is not regulated by the LCB, but instead is regulated by the Washington State Department of Health. Based on all of the above information and analysis described above, uh, director's office staff recommend that, consistent with RCW 3405 330, subsection 1A, the board deny John Kingsbury's rule petition request received on September 29, 2022. That, that concludes my presentation. I'm, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments on this one? Um, no, the only thing I'd say, I think we all talked about it yesterday. Uh, I, I, the only part of this, I think it uh, is worth talking to the industry a little bit going forward and find out what their practices are, and and because uh, the, the question's a good one. Um, and with that, is there a, a motion to deny the rules petition uh, uh, before us? I make a motion that we deny this rulemaking petition request. And a second. And this is Ali, I second. Right, then that is denied. Thanks. Mr. Thank Gilbert, appreciate that. <clears throat> okay. Um, we are now to the part of uh, general public comment. We have a lot of people signed up, both online and in person today. Um, and uh, so a couple of general reminders. Uh, everything is recorded, as we said at the beginning. Um, uh, when, if you're online, when we call your name, uh, uh, just be patient for a second while we uh, find your name on the list and, and uh, uh, Gretchen hits the right switch so you can be seen and heard. Um, and that won't be part of your time. When you start talking, we will time. Everybody has four minutes. When you have 30 seconds left, we will let you know you have 30 seconds left. So um, uh, excuse that interruption, but we just want to make sure you know. And then at four minutes, we really need everybody to, to wrap up right on time because we do have a lot of people. Um, I have some double signups here, both in person and, and showing on the virtual. Um, so if, if you're in one and not the other, please, please just let me know. Um, we will um, go ahead. Why don't we start with the people that are in the room and then I can cross those names that I see in two places uh, here. Some of the handwriting here I might need a little help in, but I know uh, the first person we have signed up is Sammy Sot. I would like to speak when Peter Manny here, because I want to, you know, I know Peter since day one, and he been using Black Excellence is his bomb to Aaron Barfield. So he being lying to the public. Well, I wish if we united, not divided. It's, no, no, so no. Is that, this is your, speak. 
You can, I can speak now if you want me to, but I would love to speak at the end or now. Um, That's fine thing, but I would love him to be in the room. Where'd he go? You want, he was you right here. Somebody else to speak on a stick out. He was just right here. Um, you want me to speak second? Uh, no, I'd really like just okay, I would call now. to be go ahead, just because I, I know the other people are signed up uh, in it. I can't yeah, tell either way. So, all okay, uh, uh, Mr. Saad, you have uh, four minutes. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. My, my name is Sami Saad. Um, uh, I'm a general contractor. I own a general mobile company, and I own a mining company overseas. And uh, I own a cannabis shop. I'm one of those the first previous cannabis owners. I started since day one. I've been in a business since 2019, and I have the shop 19. Uh, uh, I've been in a business since 2009, 2009, and I started the medical since 2009, 2010, since day one. So I have two shops, one in Rainier under my name, and one it's called uh, 12 Green, I call it, and that's in Rainier Avenue South by Orcas. And I have another one in Greenwood. But unfortunately, I've been having a phone call from the LCB when I applied for the licensing. They say, Mr. Abdullah, you're not gonna get no license. You need to destroy your application. My name is Sami Saad. Abdullah is my middle name. I've been fighting for this one since my, my father alive. He died with a big car accident. He's still being not acknowledged, being assassinated by United Nations, United States failed and, and, and on five things. You know, and this is this is murdering people. This is this is criminalized. This is criminal what they've been done to us. What we need, we don't need no point. We need to be acknowledged to get our shop first. Uncle Ike's and Hava Hard and all of those shops, they, they you know they have five and six shops. They're not black. You know, we've been and the second thing is we don't have nobody in the LCB or the social equity look like us. You know, I, I am from I'm African. But I'm not African American. I'm African. I'm mixed with a lot of different things. It don't make me better. I'm, I'm black, just like mm -hmm. everybody else. I met Peter Manny on a uh, long time ago. I've been knowing him since I have my shop, Rainier and uh, 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 Greenwood. I met Peter again in Olympia. We voted him for the SB 2070 the second time because I've been voting since day one. I'm the one made this fold with the community. I have 65,000 Washingtonians. And I'm a community leader. I teach mixed martial arts in Rainier Avenue South and volunteering in different things. So I'm very much flexible by having businesses to get help in the community. I'm very known more than Ellie Garrett. Ellie Garrett, I met her in, uh, I, I met uh, I met him again and he on uh, uh, Olympia. And he says, Sammy, how are you? Don't vote for this. This is not for us. They're using us. Uh, I am here with uh, Peter, uh, with uh, uh, Aaron Barfield. He created Black Excellent in, in cannabis. And he's fighting for us. He's the president he created, and we all can join. So it's not wrong to him. It's a lot. And, it's, and now it's, it's somebody else who is suing for this. And we all should be included. I'm the one with them. And they say, hey, fight with us. We're going to even give you, we're going to join you in a lawsuit, and you get entitled for money and licensing with us. And after that, nothing happened. And it's a lie and a fake. We get misleaded by Ellie Garrett. Ellie Garrett, she met with me in a Lucian Center. She said, we will help you publicly on everybody there, my family, my students, they want to teach them mixed martial arts, a lot of them. And, and, and when I get her phone number and the card, her and Paula Sardina, I call her like three weeks later to find out what's going on, stuff like that. She said, do not call this phone ever again. If I have any update, I'll call you. Later, I find out Dr. Rafael Rodriguez, her ex-boyfriend, and Jim B. Cannon, her boyfriend, with Peter Manny on license and M and and uh, uh, Aaron Barfield. Aaron Barfield, he will speak today. 30 seconds left. Yes, he speak here today. We've been mistreated and mistreated. Paula, she called me on the phone. He was there. I didn't know his three way. She said, you need to stay away from Christopher King and those black people. We will help you to get your license. But you need to stop talking about Ellie Garrett. It's a lobby. It's a mafia. The, the mayor, that everybody, the, 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 the governor need to know that. And after that, they say, you know what? If, if you have a brainwash, I said, I'm not going to stay away from the people just to help me help everybody. He said, fuck you. He said the F word to me. This is not right to give me the F word. Get your back. Yeah. It's not right to give the F word to okay. respect the community. Thank you. Um, the next person, like I said, I'm having a little bit of a hard time with the handwriting. It's it me. I apologize. Uh, what is it? So, no, I three, wish we were free united and we fight together, three, not divided. Three names before. For you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. It's is there my a, writing. A Pam Mims? Or a Pam? Damien Mims. What's it? Damien. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh. My yeah. brother. Yeah. My, uh, that's my writing. Damien, I'm looking at you. Yeah. 
not putting that together. Okay. Good morning. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Damian Mims. I'm an executive treasurer for Black Excellence in Cannabis. Uh, it's a statement on October 26, made by King Five facing races or facing race that it could take years for a social equity retail license to be issued accurate. Um, so far, that's true. Today, I'd like to focus on time. Let's look at a couple of timelines. From the time House Bill 5052 went into effect to the time it was opened, 80 days. That's how long it took. From the time House Bill 2870 went into effect till the time social equity licenses could be open on January 1st, 2023, we're at 934 days and counting. The existence of black and brown opportunity to personal and generational wealth is not present here in Washington State. It appears this is due to the elude and evade tactics taken by Washington State government agencies, including here at the LCB, still ongoing and present. Why do I say this, you ask? My answer, the Heinz Report of 2017. How about some questions for you guys to answer? Is LCB racist? Are black and brown people important? Is it the practice of cronyism, pay to play, nepotism, or just being conveniently ignorant? The reason why there's still successful ongoing opposition for black and brown people's fair chance to earn wealth. How about this? Will the government agencies please stop with the cloud of interdepartmental finger pointing, not my job, and delay tactics, which are affecting the retail licenses that go out to black and brown people and just get it done. Make it right. Please don't be blind to the fact that the reason why black and brown people suffer from unfair laws and missed opportunities for wealth is due to a very successful race-based system. Be honest with the public and yourselves and get going on the job of undoing the wrongs that have been done and make it right. The black and brown people have been suffering. Black and brown people in this state have suffered from unfair laws and practices since 1889, since its inception. Yes, that's going way back, but it's also true. When are the members of the Washington State agencies going to stop black and brown oppression? We want the licenses. We want the licenses where the majority of black and brown people actually live. We want a chance to end the suffering for our people, for our families. It's time to get us out of the waiting room. Thank you for your time. Next person signed up in the room is uh, uh, Talbo. Talbot. Um, this is, I might have to speak for him because okay. he has a cancer patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you, he, is it okay if I speak for him? Yeah. I mean, it's not, he has some things. He's, can you talk? Yeah. I mean, if he's, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Whatever whatever works for you guys okay. is well, fine. I just, you, you're signed up to talk next and you don't get two times to talk. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, but you I, know. I don't know. I don't want to speak. Yeah, because, if you uh, want Black, uh, uh, United Black Please. Pioneers, okay. they told me to speak in their behalf. No. So if that's the case, no. give me a chance. Okay. Nobody is no. speaking on his behalf. Yeah, we're no, we're going to give this gentleman no. his no. his chance to talk and if he needs a little assistance, no, no we're going to no give problem. him a little assistance. No but if you guys don't give Please. to those people, don't they worry. started first, there is no equality. Sam. Okay. I he, he has. Uh, I, yeah, want to, I understand. I want well, to lay down context of who he is, because uh, yeah. then he's here to support what he says. He currently battled. His name is Byron Talbert. He was part of Bella Soleil back in 2011, 2012, yeah. uh, and 13 until Bella Soleil. Be, it was a collective. He was diagnosed in 2012 with prostate cancer. He successfully beat that. Uh, his cancer. That went into remission and went away, but he came back and he has throat cancer, which he has a huge tube going from his and I don't want to make him stand. Okay, uh, right. Uh, so, uh, but Mr. He, Talbot, this it's is better for you to sit. That's fine. Yeah, I can. Yeah, here. Can we let him sit down, please? So, the reason he, he felt it was important to come here today to speak uh, to the board, and I should have said uh, board member, um, 
Postman and Bellendrop and I'll hear him. Excuse me, but uh, I thought his story was important. And so did he. He currently can't afford the medications from the dispensaries because they're not only are they located far away from him, but the medicines that he were he was receiving from the cannabis in 2011, in 2012, in 2013, when there's dispensaries were relatively cheap and affordable. And this is the problem. I wanted to, he is a victim of what the system has become, what it evolved into today. The people that cannabis initially were created for were created for people like this person here. This, this is truly a pioneer in the sense of using cannabis for, to treat a medical condition. And he's being left out on the, on, the, on the roadside. And I think that he, I spoke with him last week via Zoom, him and his daughter, and I told him that we would rent a van, we would come down here today and tell the story to the board. Because I think that there's many more like him in our, in our community that we collectively have. And I think that we need to bring this forward to, to you guys, to the LCB. We have to understand that there's other victims that stem from not only the, the, the economic opportunities that we were overlooked, but there's also other victims that actually use cannabis for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. And I think that we got to start opening up this channel. And I think black people need to stop speaking of cannabis as it's illegal. And I think white state detective stands that black people talking about cannabis isn't illegal. This is what got us here in this quagmire now is because those two sides. But anyway, yeah, try to keep your what your comments now to what Mr. Talbot wants to okay. share. You'll have your chance in a minute. Yes. Um, is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, no. Why? Why can we have uh, dispensary? Why are we being oh, discriminated against having dispensaries that helps a lot of people like me? You know, and, and it does help. But we've been discriminated all these years because we're black. I feel, you know, you know, some people look at us the wrong way, you know, we're not bad people, not to, you know, we just need help sometimes, you know, and it's been helping me during these years, and it really helped me during my, have my cancer and everything, it's really helped me, but it's been hard for me the last three years, because I can't get, get through with it, you know, and we, we said we've been, Push back from what things that we really need because of our our race, you know. And I like to see a change in that. You know, this is a new year, you know, a new time, and we need to change things. You know. Three then. All right. Okay. And that's just about your time there. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. Talbot. Let well, him let's see, let's see his better for him closer than going far away. One, one it's sweet to see here. Uh, you want to I'll help you when I get my license. <laughs> yes, sir. I yes, I will. And this is for Green LLC. I will. I've been homeless, have been homeless. For the longest. Okay, so no. Peter Manning, you're up next. You have your four okay. minutes. Usually, I'm, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the board uh, for having me, uh, board member chair, uh, Volendrop. It's good to see you in person, and Ollie Garrett. Uh, this is, I think that, that what I wanted to say is, is, you know, I I have received a lot of phone calls from a lot of different uh, people and agencies after the King Five. <laughs> after the King Five thing aired. Um, and it it's it surprises me that you know here we are we're 10 years into the cannabis industry and we're still talking about inclusion you know i i started this fight in 2014 and here i am in 2022 almost 2023 and i i, I realize there's a lot of different uh mechanisms at work to prevent us from getting there um, and I know that some of these mechanisms, we're smart enough people, no matter where we come from, to prevent these. And there are certain people in power that I think with the power, we can prevent 
certain things from happening to us to prevent black and brown people from become from becoming part of this industry. Um, what we need to do, this pe the people that came with us today are victims of being marginalized and not given the opportunity or not given the fair opportunity to um, participate in the cannabis uh, industry. There's victims here today that uh, benefited from the cannabis industry for medicinal purposes in the past. Those same opportunities have been robbed from them if they're plagued with any type of ailment today because they are not able to get the quality of cannabis from those medical dispensaries that are currently operating, nor are they accessible because they are placed in very far away. Like Kent, there's no medical or no cannabis dispensaries in Kent. So this what happens where Mr. Talbert lives. He has to travel him and his daughter when they can afford to go uh, to Renton to get cannabis that doesn't really uh, suit the, his needs. We need to understand that we have to recognize that there's some serious problems. And I was told a couple of weeks ago that we would be looking into what I assume would be in, to rectify what was done, done to several black individuals unjustly. And I received word from a friend of mine that somehow I misunderstood or, and this is another thing about transparency and clarity. Um, if anybody knows me, I repeat myself at least three times. Um, or I'll ask you a question two or three times. Because I really want to understand what you're communicating to me, and I want, I want to understand what I'm communicating to you, and I want you to understand the same. I need transparency. There's victims here currently. There's victims here that were wronged by this agency. There was victims here that were plucked. The opportunity was plucked away from them unjustly. I think that needs to be looked at before we can even move farther. You know, you cannot, this is the only institution that I know that completely disregards people, what they've done to people in the past. It's, I don't understand it. There's no, there's, there's no, there is no other agency that I believe that overlooks the past harms that they cause other than the LCB. And I'm sorry to say that, but that's what I truly believe. And I hope this changes. Uh, I am the president of the Black Excellence of Cannabis. We are incorporated. Uh, I am an original co-founder of that. And I just need to clarify that as well. Thank you. Uh, the next person we have signed up, the last name I believe is- uh, Manny, Yasmin. Yes, she doesn't. Oh. She's she's opted out. You don't want she, to talk? Okay. She, this is my daughter. And that's oh, my son well, down there. Okay. Uh, she wanted to come speak her piece today. Uh, she had something on her mind. She wanted to say. You don't want to share? I think Too she's much saying stuff. it right there. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Thank yeah, you. She, okay, that was it. She okay. had something to say, but no. All right. Is Welcome. There? Okay. This is this is where your father. Could have made is. history. This is where your father is every other Wednesday, just in case you wondered. Yeah, you could have made history. Okay, so, um, we will now move uh, online uh, to, to people who, who are going to testify. Uh, and the first person uh, signed up is Christopher King. Yeah, Christopher King, he sent me a text message to speak on his behalf, the same way he spoke about the gentleman. And he's no. working today. No. No, yeah. I'm here. I got a quick minute. Nice okay, try. So I, you, you tell me that you go ahead, Mr. There. King, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> so I, I want to follow up to this transparency theme that was just uh, initiated by uh, Peter Manning. The transparency of it is uh, everybody knows that Black Excellence in Cannabis was truly founded by Aaron Barfield. And that's why I'm suing uh, Mike Asai as a, ta as a taxpayer, Mike Asai and Peter Manning for usurping that name. It's all in the documents. You guys have all seen the lawsuit. I'm going forward with it. He could talk about his transparency and his role in Black Excellence in a court of law uh also and also there's a defamation issue in there too because they keep saying that all i do is criticize ollie garrett that's clearly not true it's a false statement it's materially false and it subjects me to scorn and ridicule because it looks they're trying to make it appears if all i do is attack ollie garrett it's false uh demonstrably false so that's that next in terms of transparency why is it that sammy sod still can't get his application okay we've asked that for half a year i've been asking for that 
Sammy went down to the, uh, the state house the other day to the governor's office to ask for a copy of his application. As we all know, the federal judge down in, in this district lied and said he didn't apply. He did apply. Okay, I have part of his application. So why can't we get that at the year? All right. Also, why can't we get the information back as to what uh, Eric, when uh, Kevin Shelton wrote to you guys, and this is the whole thing with Nate Gate, when Nate Miles wanted to take 49% of his company and it was going to go through Chris Bennett and then his uh, ex-father-in-law ex James and to Ollie Garrett, that letter, I keep sending you, I showed you the letter he sent, certified mail, can't get a response to what the protocol is for receiving those letters, what happened to it. All we got back was the same letter that he sent, okay? And you want to talk about transparency? It's ridiculous. But it's apparently ridiculous. Uh, I don't know what to say right now, but uh, you know, everything, you know, I'm transparent. All right. This entire board has has been nothing but a mockery. And furthermore, we had that evidence that the, the the liquor cannabis board colluded with the city of Seattle against black interest in RK Ventures versus City of Seattle. I've I've sent that link out too. 2002 case. You guys were busted for colluding with the city against black interest. And it was the white store owners, it was the white guys who had that club who were playing black themed music that were allowed to sue. But the patrons who were listening to the black themed music who were largely black, they didn't have standing to sue. But anyway, that's the history, okay? I've, I've never misspoken a thing, all right? It's just, just the facts. So you expect the public now to believe that you're earnest when we can't even get documentation? Please, I got uh, back to work. Have a nice day. Oh, but also, Mr. Postman, let me disabuse you of the notion that some things are not productive. You, you want to talk about how conversations are productive or not, okay? Believe me, my conversations with you are very productive. You may not like what they produce, but I'm going to disabuse you of the notion that they're not productive. Have a nice day. You too. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, John Kingsbury is up next. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay. So I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. Give me a moment, Chair. Yeah, sure. No problem. So it looks like John Kingsbury did register to speak, but he's not online today. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dustin. We will uh, move on then. The next person uh, we have signed up is Mr. Oba. Please go ahead, sir. He's muted. Oh, you got to unmute. Uh, he's unmuted from our end, right, Crutch? Yeah. Okay. There you are. Yep. Here you are. My name is Jay Farish Oba. AKA Papa John. I'm a president of the Senior Cannabis Connection, former member of Black Excellent in Cannabis, as well as Bella Soul Collective. And what I'm here for is we've been trying for some time, maybe six years, to get our license reinstated that were falsely removed from a priority one uh, by the LCB. And I think with uh, others as proponent, proponents in, in the uh, situation, what I'm concerned about is why does it take so long for the LCB to act on a situation that they have studied and know was done uh, in a manner that was biased and I believe racist. Racist in the sense that many of you have brought up the fact that black and brown people are not able to be inclusively included in this wealth building cannabis industry. An industry which is very easy to build wealth because so many people are into this product. It doesn't even have to be marketed, it markets itself. But the problem I have is being 83 years old, seeing this racism and inequity play out for 83 years. I used to ask my 
white friend who lived across the street as we were growing up. When will this stop? And he said, well, man, when I get grown, I'm going to make sure I'm not that type of person. But unfortunately, many whites are that type of person because they get inundated with it as children and as they grow, refuse to use their own mind. You people are in a situation where, or in a position where you can use your own mind to know that wrongs have been disseminated against black and brown peoples. And you're in a, you're in a position that you can do something about it in your position. So, you know, we, we hear the excuses, 83 years of excuses. I remember, and I'll say this, and I'm out of here. When I was in the service, 18 mortars came in on top of us. And the one white lieutenant, he panicked, so he got up to run. We knew he'd be cut to pieces. We grabbed him and laid on top of him. We didn't think about him being white. We didn't think about him having privilege. We didn't think about him maybe being from a family that is racist or discriminate. We thought about him as a human being who needed help immediately to protect his life. And we laid on top of him. And when that ice cream hill was reduced to a flat surface like you do an ice cream cone, three people had got hit. But neither he nor I or the Three or four guys that laid on top of him got hit. Mr. Elby, you have 30 seconds. So I would say this. You've studied these situations. You study the truth to know the truth. And then after you find out the truth, you correct it. You've studied this situation concerning these licenses, and they were wrongly taken. You've studied it. Now, reinstate the license. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Ova. Appreciate that. Next person signed up is David Busby. How's it going? Is it working? Yeah, hello. How are you doing, David? Awesome, thanks. Uh, appreciate you having me again and again and again. Um, recently, you guys asked all of us software integrators for the uh, updated for the CTRS system access application. And there's just a few um, issues with this one. Uh, the document is worded such that the, you know, the software integrators puts us in an obligation to provide a, a service level agreement from us it, to the LCB and possibly from us to our clients. Um, but we don't really have a service level agreement from the LCB. And, and I would like to get some kind of service level agreement from the LCB. What can we know that the CCRS system is going to do if we're obligated to, you know, meet some requirements into that system? You know, one issue that's still outstanding is there's no positive confirmation of data received by CCRS. The LCB has stated that if no errors are generated, then we consider that success. But it's been demonstrated and mentioned in these meetings before that CCRS has not generated errors when we know that it should have. In other cases, you know, we we push data in there. We go to make an attempt to update the data later, and it says that the data is not present. That's a little concerning. You know, it makes it difficult for us to ensure the data is in there when it says it is, but it actually isn't. Um, another blocking issue: putting this data in there, especially for business transfers and the laboratory results. Uh, for some of this information, it is not possible for us to upload the information because other licensees or other software have not uploaded that information. That blocks us from uploading what we have. We can't put a sale record in to receive inventory if the other party who's sending us the material hasn't put that inventory into CCRS. Same story with lab results. If the inventory is not in CCRS, the lab results can't make it into CCRS. And it's not possible for one licensee to obligate another licensee to put their data into CCRS. And it's not possible for one software vendor to obligate another software vendor to get that data into CCRS. And, and additionally, to comply with some of these requirements, the software providers need access to data that's only available via FOIA requests. And that information is not available in a timely fashion. 
some of the necessary data, which had been previously supplied by the agency on more than one occasion, is no longer provided. And when asked to remedy that, the agency ignored the request. Other necessary information, the agency has denied the request, claiming they don't have the records, but how is a license issued if a record for it doesn't exist? All of this stuff seems like it could be solved with just slightly better technology, a, a little bit of a real-time API to give us co positive confirmation of data going in, maybe not letting some people delay their data for ever so long and possibly not getting it in there, blocking other people for time and time and time. You know, maybe making it so that licensed data lookup could happen in a real time mechanism, uh, including some of the other details that used to be available but are now not available. Um, and then just to add, with the board interim policy that was removed today about the uh, external products for the CBD additives, um, there's not really any guidance in the CCRS documentation on how to handle that kind of material. And so maybe the CCRS documentation could get updated now. You have that, 30 seconds. Thank you. That we might have to put that information in there, some some guidance, and uh, maybe there's even an opportunity for the LCB and the integrators to have another sit down like we used to. Thanks for your time. Yeah, okay, good. Well, thank you for all of that. I'm sure uh, folks are listening from that department, but we'll make sure we follow up. Thank you, David. Uh, next is Suzanne Brown. Suzanne, are you able to unmute yourself? We have you uh, opened up on our end. Maybe we'll move to the next and come there. back. Oh, there Hello. you are. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is uh, Suzanne Brown. I'm a former collective garden member, and now I'm a member of the Senior Cannabis Connection. Uh, I'm a concerned Washington State citizen and a Democrat. I'm concerned about the slow progress towards true social equity and bias towards black and brown cannabis licensing. I fail to understand the slow progress towards equity in the Washington State cannabis industry. Um, there has been a social equity committee for years, as well as this LCB board. Uh, so why no progress? Um, I support black excellence in cannabis and actually um, see how hard they work in pursuing, pushing forward towards equity. I have watched Peter Manning working tirelessly for years toward change. So I ask again, why is change taking so long? And by the way, I'm a white woman interested in progress in Washington state in this industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person is uh, Mike Kasai. Hi, good morning. Everybody can hear me? Okay. Uh, Valandroff, I didn't know you were going to be present today. I would have uh, took some extra pain meds and made it down. Uh, <laughs> good to see, uh, see you. Um, okay. Uh, good morning, board members uh, Garrett Valandroff and Chair Postman. My name is Mike Asai, founder of Emerald City Collective, first downtown Seattle dispensary, 2010. I am also the vice president of Black Excess and Cannabis. I'd like to take a brief moment to defend Ali Garrett. I 
I have been disgusted by the attacks on board member Garrett the past several months. Enough is enough. The reason we as Black Pioneers have been cut out is not by the actions of Ali or current board members, but the action of the prior LCB board in 2010 to 2015 and some current LCB staff. The lies said about board member Garrett are highly out of bounds, especially coming from people in the Black community. Ali is a main part of why we even have social equity in Washington State. For the record, Ali had nothing to do with the issuance of Emerald Hayes retail license. Emerald Hayes retail license is a lottery license won by Miles Alexander in 2013. Emerald Hayes had a grand opening in April of 2015. Ali was not a board member or had any connections to the LCB at this time. From the time Miles won the lottery in 2013 and opened Emerald Hayes April of 2015, Aaron Barfield, Jim Buchanan, Rafael Rodriguez became part owners. Any person with common sense would know it would be humanly impossible for Ali to mastermind a plan in 2013 to award Miles Alexander a license while having no attachments to the LCB. Emerald Hayes license was not issued to Jim Buchanan. It was a lottery license won by Miles Alexander in 2013. Leave this beautiful black woman alone. Ali, I stand by you. The black community stands by you. Black excellence in cannabis stands by you, and we will continue to support you. Moving on to the social equity program. We see the LCB is once again giving out misleading information from its website. This type of deception went on before in 2015 and seems to continue to grow as of now in 2022. I'm holding up a current map, I don't have it, but you guys know, that shows uh, retail locations developed for social equity. A person not attending the, the manipulated task force over the past two years would think the map is showing 42 active licenses for the social equity program. False. This map is not transparent. Once again, this is the playbook LCB has done before. No rush to apply sound familiar? I must say I am disappointed by the recent actions of the LCB. Community spoke loud and clear during the 2020 Listen and Learn sessions. Black pioneers were shut out. The current delays of the program going live should have been ironed out in 2021. LCB had enough time to get ready. Manipulated Task Force gave out the recommendations January of this year. My question is why? Why has the LCB taken uh, this long and almost to 2023, a full year to get the social equity active? We wonder if we will ever have a successful social equity program in Washington state. Three weeks ago, I was involved in a head-on collision, not my fault. By the grace of God, I am alive, talking, and walking. Mike, I could have been seconds. killed. Thank you. I could have been killed not only three weeks ago, but at any time since 2016. Myself and many other black and brown pioneers who were shut out have lost out, have lost millions of generational wealth. The opportunity of wealth lost not able to leave for our children and families. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Glad you're doing OK. Hang in there. Uh, next person signed up is Linda Sanchez. <clears throat> oh. Chair, I Technical difficulties. I think I just disconnected Ms. Sanchez. OK, hopefully she will reconnect. We'll keep an eye out for her trying to join and, and come back uh, uh, to her. Uh, the next person I have signed up is uh, Tony Herrick. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Well, my name is Tony Herrick, and um, I uh, I am a 65-year-old uh, white woman also, and, um, you know, I've known the Manning family for many years, but today I'm here on behalf of my daughter-in-law. Um, she is currently working today, and uh, since I work from home, I'm able to have joined your meeting, and I appreciate being able to listen. Uh, my daughter-in-law had her store taken um, uh, 
some years back, um, uh, within the past 10 years, I want to say, and um, because she was affiliated with Black men in the industry. And um, she has been trying to, with the assistance of Peter Manning, um, get her store returned to her um, for several years here. And um, it has been going back and forth. So, so we're hoping today is the day that you know, we can uh, get our voice heard and have this um, be returned to her. I support the Black excellence in cannabis because they are bringing to light about white-only uh, cannabis industries in Washington. And I am going to keep it short and sweet. And again, thank you for letting me share. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Thanks for joining us. Um, <clears throat> Dustin, did you see Linda Sanchez? I got, yeah, we got Linda Sanchez back online. I'm going to uh, okay. open up her controls right now. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Ms. Sanchez, whenever you can. Hi, my name is Linda Sanchez, and I believe in the message and change Peter Manny is trying to create and make a difference with different cultures, backgrounds in our communities. There shouldn't be any unbalance of equal and unfairness with the people of color, like me that I am Latina, graduated with my psychology bachelor's. Black and brown culture should be respected and treated equal, just like they as well treat white, Caucasian color and their culture. What type of message is that giving to the new and old generation? Is that showing change in equity to family, friends, and those who we don't know? Whether those who are only interested in color identifiers is a message we want to give to our world. Peter Manny is not just thinking of himself. He's just trying to fight hard for the unfairness that he and others have been treated towards facing those who have power and control over his own growth. As we know, racism is learned and we know tension can flare with painful memories and experiences. Standing against racism should not be punishment and should not be a suspension for those in color. Instead, should those who believe in unfairness should recognize the injustice and should listen more to understand and relearn what in racial and justice is because giving Manny his permission license without him able to use it where he was located in Seattle is wrong by having to replace a Caucasian white person in his own location where he was told that he was banned to open. But yet the white human being is continuing the business where the black American was told to get out. Now that is injustice of human rights and professional business. Now if not recognize this is simply by justifying their own actions, then I support 100% Manny for all the black and American Latinos that we are to be taken seriously and to be respected when following all the laws and rules appropriately and as such should be treated equal. If there should be a change from injustice of being brown and Latino and black, we need more brown and Latino black people in cannabis industry to be supported and to be recognized. But I also noticed that you also mentioned that licensing chooses what to approve and is not when approved for those in public for their businesses and that they do a great job on it. So why can't Peter Manny and black and brown people continue their businesses if they are being approved for their licenses responsibly? Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your comments. Uh, next is Ahmed King.
Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Sure can. Go ahead. All right, my name is Ahmed King. I am representing Black Excellence in Cannabis. I'm the Executive Secretary. Uh, let me give a shout out to Peter Manning, Mike Asai, uh, Holly Garrett, how you doing? And uh, to uh, everybody in attendance, Rick Garza, all the LCB staff, and everybody who has commented. Um, I am also the son of Papa John. So you're looking at somebody or a family, children and families, two generations that have been impacted from a loss of generational wealth. Let me tell you about my father. He always put his family first. He put God and his family first. He's always been a stand-up man of high moral character and, 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 and value. He's helped out many people in the community. At 83 years old, for him to have I'm 45, so if he's experienced 83 years of lack of equality and equity, I've experienced 45. But never has my father spoke ill about another black man or woman in public in a form like this. He is also, he raised us to love all people, to accept all people. So I want to talk really quick about equality and equity and what the differences are. Equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. So where has the equality been at LCB? And I do respect you all. Again, thank you to everybody who, who just even does this job. It takes a lot of courage and dedication, no matter what your ethnicity is. Equity, recognize that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So again, when it comes to waiting, I like what my father said, you people are in, an, in a unique position to do something, to be trendsetters, to live truth to power. You could do it today. You could do it today. So what I propose is that you release that license to my father. You release that li license to Mike Asai, to Peter Manning. In good faith. In good faith. Why? Because you're in the business of government. In equity. What is equity? We 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 provide equity. You're supposed to provide equity when all else fails. So what is fair? I'm also glad that my father didn't raise me to be an angry black man, because I would be really angry thinking about the generational wealth that we've missed out on, the tens of millions of dollars, and not only my family but the other families that we could touch, that we could impact. Peter Manning is a pioneer. He also has never publicly bashed another black man or woman on a forum like this. And I think that we need to stand in more solidarity, no matter what side of the coin that we're on. Because as black people and brown people, we definitely know what we're up against. We're up against the system. You're not really up against another flesh and blood person. The system has been in place for a while. So we need to come together in solidarity and I'm remember what, seconds. what is important. Thank you. And really briefly, really quick, also what I do, I'm also in the cannabis industry uh, and I work for a distributor. I do delivery and I do sales. LCB, these stores are being robbed. We need more protection as delivery drivers as well. I'm out there putting my life on the line and so are many other people. But I'm going to keep that short. The main point being that we need equality and equity, and it can be done today. We don't need to wait anymore. Thank you again for all you do. Many blessings to everybody. And shout out, Dad. That was eloquent. Dad, I appreciate you, man. I love you. Thank you, Mr. King. Appreciate your comments. Um, last person I've signed up is uh, Jamar Urban. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jamar Irving. I'm an African American that's 21 years of age. I support black and brown excellence in cannabis and believe there should be more black, more black and brown owned businesses. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. That's the last person we uh, have uh, signed up. Um, I am uh, not going to try to respond to all the comments at all. I, I do want to just give a little bit of information for those who might not 
be aware, aware of where the LCB is at at this point on the question of social equity licenses. Um, we do have a program. The rules were approved just recently. <clears throat> Our licensing division is hard at work uh, getting that ready to accept applications. We have uh, hired a, a, a leading uh, a firm out of Chicago that that has experience in the field that to, to help us at this point. We have other people coming on. Um, we uh, had proposed rules early in the, in the year, and we decided to not move forward with those and pull them down and amend them and do it again because we wanted to do better. And I believe we did do better. And in fact, the product that uh, was approved by this board recently includes uh, some of the very things that people uh, have been asking for, in, including in today's comments. Um, that has been acknowledged by some, some people in the community as an improvement over what was there, uh, that there was some confidence in that. And, and somehow over the last two weeks, that's been lost, which I can't explain. But we haven't changed anything in the last two weeks. Uh, we're moving ahead with our, our program. We will be accepting applications. Um, there, there certainly is a, a, a lot of work to be done. We need to, to have good data on what a, a economically distressed area looks like and where those are and how it's calculated. Um, you know, we have spent every one of these three board members uh, and key staff um, have acknowledged um, uh, repeatedly through through my I've only been here 18 months, but through those 18 months to acknowledge uh, much of what. Uh, people have talked about here today. Uh, we're well aware of, of, of lost opportunities. Uh, we're, we, we recognize uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, are moved by uh, concerns and the reality of systemic racism that exists, um, that the war on drugs uh, disproportionately impacted communities of color. Um, but we can't just keep talking about that. We did work. We put rules together with, with again, input from many of the people that were that you all heard from today. They didn't reach uh, our standards. So we sat them down and we did them again. And people complained. They said, you're taking too much time. And we said, yeah, but they're going to be better. And they are better. And it was worth it. I believe it was worth it. Um, the task force uh, recommendations uh, did not... Uh, clear the way for us to act. The task force was giving recommendations to both the legislature and the LCB, um, but it wasn't a complete package. Uh, we needed to, to translate that into something that was workable, uh, fair, um, and defensible in a court of law because we knew there would be legal challenges. Um, again, we think we have that program. It, it is uh, uh, going forward as fast as humanly possible at this point. Um, that does not mean that from the beginning this has happened as quick as it should. Um, it would have been nice if the initiative in the first place set a different course, but it didn't. The legislature didn't do anything. We brought a bill to the legislature. That changed the course. They created a task force. We, we, we worked with the task force. Uh, member Garrett was a member of that task force. Uh, many of you uh, saw her there doing that work. And so, again, we have a package. It's not true that nothing is happening. Um, and we will uh, have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, live or die by, by our performance at this point. Um, I won't ask people to trust us or be patient. I know how hollow that rings. Um, all I can do is tell you what the facts are, that there is a program, that it's coming, that it's better than it was uh, even before we, better than what we had originally proposed, and it's better than it was because the people inside the LCB challenged themselves to overcome any of their short-sightedness uh, on this question. People were pushing each other, questioning each other, and listening to the community listening to the community very specifically on the question of, of say, for example, uh, people who ran medical dispensaries. Um, and it's just unfortunate that that somehow is lost in the conversation. So I just want to take this chance to, to, to do that update, to tell you what's there. 
Um, we are, are working with um, people all across the agency to make sure the right information gets out in a timely fashion. Um, I do not think, you know, that um, it will ever move fast enough for anybody. We all wish it could happen faster. Um, and uh, but we won't be uh, uh, dissuaded from moving ahead, even though, you know, we also need to acknowledge and understand that there are people not in this room today, but who may be watching, who don't want us to do any of this, who would be perfectly happy to stop this in its tracks. And we're not letting that stop us either. So yeah, we have to take a, 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 a position that may make us unpopular with a lot of different people, but we have a plan, we're moving forward, we won't be dissuaded. And if people have questions about that, they should reach out to us. They should email us. They could email any board member and we'll get you answers. If we don't have them ourselves, we'll get you answers from, from the experts in this building who, who can, can answer it. It won't always be the answer you want. I don't get all the answers I want here and I'm in charge. It doesn't work that way, but we can ask and we can challenge each other and we can disagree but we shouldn't uh, uh, overlook the facts of, of, of what, what's here, the work that's gone in, and the fact that the community has been heard, that it's uh, 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 just a demonstrable fact that uh, uh, community input was heard, uh, was processed, and influenced the outcome. And, and that's something that, that, that the people who put their time in here uh, should be proud of, um, and I'm glad we listened. Well, then I'll see if my colleagues want to say anything before we close today. Uh, I have nothing uh, uh, substantially uh, to, substantial uh, to uh, add to that, but I do want to say that in the time that I've been a board member, which has been since May of this year, um, I have been impressed with the community involvement in this conversation. I've been impressed with the work that I've seen uh, internally, um, and we do see the sense of urgency in, um, you know, as David said, Chair Postman said, um, some words may sound hollow, but we do, there are things coming, and I am proud of the work that I've seen happen here in the short amount of time that I've been here. Thank you, Chair Ballandra. Okay, and th that's it. We will uh, adjourn the board meeting uh, for uh, November, whatever it is today. I don't know what it is, 9th. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, back this afternoon for an executive management team. Uh, thank you all for coming today. So today is uh, with the next meeting. The next